democratizing access to supercomputing through open hardware. And that's uh, Andreas uh, Olofsson. Oh, it's, uh, this is a project we started last year. Um, and uh, it, uh, uh, it's been a very, very long year. Um, but uh, it's, uh, we're, it's coming together now, finally. And uh, what we wanted to do was, was give people access to server level or super level, uh, super computer level performance at a low price and, and be open at the same time. So this is what we built. You know, it's a $99 computer. It's not a supercomputer, but at $99 and five watts, you can actually build a supercomputer with these things. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's a unique device, and it's got you know, a parallel code processor. It's got FPGA logic at, at a pretty uh, ridiculous price. And um, um, you know, we, we think uh, some of you will, could possibly build some amazing applications with this. So, um, you know, why did we do this? One of the big reasons was uh, parallel computing is the future. And, uh, and it's, it's extremely clear to us and, and to, I think, many researchers. And if you look at the, the history of computing, you know, Van Neumann computing, which, you know, started all, is going to be a blip in the history of computing if you really zoom out. You go out 50 years, 100 years, serial computing doesn't scale. You know, we've, it was a very, very good solution at the time. It is a good solution, but it's, it's just hitting a brick wall. And then you go, right, well, so parallel computing is the future. But, you know, what we found out in trying to sell a parallel processor is nobody knows how to program this thing. You know, if you go to Los Alamos Labs and the military, sure, a lot of people there might know it. They come from a supercomputing background. But 99% of programmers don't know how to do parallel programming yet. And so there's, we were at this huge impasse where there is a better solution out there, but there are no users. And that was one of the reasons we launched this. Um, and uh, you know, there, there's lots of good reasons for, for being open as a company. Uh, but I think for us, the, the, the best data point that we bring, we used to be a very paranoid semiconductor company, as, as most are. You know, NDAs on everything, no open data sheets. And, uh, you know, we didn't really realize that it was killing the company. And opening up, and, uh, you know, we're not an open hardware chip company, but we are an open platform company, open data sheets, open drivers. Doing that openness was the best thing we could have done. In fact, the company would have been dead today if we didn't do it. Um, so I'll just go through some slides now and uh, showing off what we did this year. Uh, that's me at the uh, Open Hardware Summit last year. I was still smiling then. This was the evening that we launched the Kickstarter project. Um, we did pretty well the first day, but not well enough. Um, and so, you know, the reason I show up the prototype after we launched the project it was we had a prototype, but a prototype is a very vague word. And, uh, uh, you know, like some other speakers said, um, really, you should never do a Kickstarter project unless you have a product that's ready for production. You should be ready to push the button and produce 10,000 units. That's, that's a prototype ready for, for pre-orders or, or Kickstarter. Uh, don't launch a prototype that still has work to do. This was our prototype. It cost $2,500 and, and, and burned 15 watts and was this big. All we had to do was push this down to $99 and, and 5 watts, right? No problem. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I'm an optimist, an eternal optimist, and I believe we could do it. I had, you know, I had the, the, the simulations and everything else that showed that we should be able to do it. But you know, a lot of things are not under your control, and that's when you run into trouble. For example, for us, the suppliers, convincing them that they should give us volume pricing on every one of our parts, and we're only going to build 5,000, that turned out to be incredibly difficult. Um, and uh, when you, you have to ship 6,000 of these things, um, at $99, well, what if you start off with a bill of material that's $200? Now you're taking a $100 loss on every board. That's, that's a lot of money at, at five or 10,000 units. So, um, so that, was, that was a huge scare. Um, the campaign for us was brutal. You know, I'm, I'm really jealous of the uh, Kickstarter campaigns that make all their money in the first day. We uh, sweated the whole time through 30 days, and then the last day our, our backers came together. We kept working the whole time, never gave up, and uh, we made our funding goal you know, of $750,000, and uh, we got to celebrate for one night, and then next morning it was, uh, <laughs> oh shit, <laughs> uh, back to work. Um, and then we went quiet for a while, because we really had to make this a production level platform that people could use. We shipped out uh, the early, early prototypes to backers in, in January uh, that people could start developing software on. So we were kind of on schedule. The board layout itself, turn out to be way more complex than I anticipated. Um, it's a 12-layer board with just a bunch of stuff on it. And it, it was, uh, 
It was a scary moment until we actually could fit all the components on the card because we didn't want to increase the size of the board. We wanted it to be credit card sized. And, um, uh, and at, but at this point, we kind of knew that, you know what, we're, uh, we're going to make it. It's going to be OK. Um, of course, we hadn't gotten the boards back yet. So in April, we got them back. This was good. It powered up very, fairly quickly. A few bugs that we fixed with wires. Um, we, um, we ran Linux uh, within, I think, two weeks. And um, things looked good. And then problems. Uh, two months of everything going wrong, from issues with our manufacturer to our you know, bugs that we couldn't just quite get a handle on uh, in cleaning up the platform. There were power issues, so we had to put a fan uh, on the board, which was obviously unacceptable. Um, and this was just you know, heads down working on it. And when you have 5,000 backers that really want you to succeed but still are waiting for, for, for you to you know, deliver, that's very, very painful. Um, and, uh, but in July, things really started to get cleaned up and they, and they came together. We had really a, a, a um, scalable solution that was very robust that we could um, you know, put together clusters like this. So we started preparing for shipment. We shipped it out the early boards, Gen Zero, and, uh, and people are using them today. Uh, you know, I think the verdict is, is pretty good. They're, they're usable, right? Um, they're not good enough to ship to 10,000, but they're, they're pretty good. And, uh, this is kind of where we are right now. Uh, that's not me. That's I look usually worse than that. But uh, um, but it's it's um, it's been a really really tough year. Uh, we're almost there. Uh, we're uh, we're out with uh, at the MIT table showing off our uh, our Gen Zero boards, the Gen One boards that came back today that uh, I powered this morning. No smoke. Things are good. A couple of firmware fixes, but I should have an update on Monday where we stand. But that's supposed to be. Uh, a fanless board that, that is just, just right. Um, we got uh, 8,000 Epiphany chips back this week, uh, almost perfect yield, and so we're good, we're good to go there. And uh, right now we're, uh, we're looking at starting shipment in September, finishing about 10,000 shipments at the end of October, and um, it's, uh, it's a race, but uh, um, you know, we're going to make it. So thank you.